One of the panellists um, particularly uh, wants to share some thoughts with us and I think as part of that wants to throw some challenges uh, to Susan. So Adam, will you kick off this session with the panel and rise to that invitation? Well, thank you very much indeed. I am completely, totally, utterly intimidated. I, That's not a challenge. No, it's not going to be much of a challenge. It was a stonking speech, and I'm completely intimidated. I'm intimidated not just because of the current level of intellectual horsepower in this room, because of all the ghosts of the intellectual horsepower mm. in this room, which I'm highly aware of, because I was last in this room when I was aged 11, helping an experiment on a Christmas lecture. So I am completely intimidated, and it's already been mentioned the inadequacy of blokes, especially blokes wearing a tie. We can't uh, multitask, and the thought of being, having to listen to the lecture, frame a question, talk at the same time. So I wrote it down, <coughs> but it is That's in a long big. Question, isn't yeah, it? but it's big print. It's size 16 <laughs> print. So it's pre I've crossed out the first paragraph. So now, basically, of course, we are all technophilic monkeys. We just veer between sort of techno lust and techno-bigotry. And that's actually the as question this evening. Mean, as we men, uh, No, we technophilic monkeys, okay. because uh, that's a piece of technology. These are pieces of technology. We all love our bits of technology. So all fiction, movies, books, plays, all fiction is a simulation. Games are just a higher bandwidth simulation. If one thinks there is a difference between a Shakespeare play, War and Peace, or perfecting your character in World of Warcraft, is this not just techno-bigotry? If you, of course there is a difference between the platforms as there is a difference between a work of art, a book, or a piece of music. But if you've actually spent time playing a game, you know it's catharsis, you know it has art, and you know it tells a story. So is this techno-bigotry that different from a 19th century parent screaming, get your nose out of that book? Because sitting here in the 21st century, we forget about the shock of literature and how the non-literate parent felt so threatened by the arrival of literacy. And those of you who have English degrees, it's an Arabist late 19th century degree, to make the point. So what are we dealing with? Is that, uh, is that issue about literacy that different from my parents telling me, for God's sake, go out and play, you're watching too much television, or other people telling me that rock and roll was evil? In fact, cyber anxiety is the latest worry for an older generation facing a technology they were not born with. Now let me give you a quote. We are dealing, as you heard this evening, we are dealing with the mental health of a generation, the care of which we have left too long in the hands of unscrupulous persons. These products could cause violence, juvenile delinquency, and contribute to homosexuality. This was said by Frederick Wortham in 1954 in his book, Seduction of the Innocent. Wortham was a well-credentialed, Doctor, a scientist, he had a degree from the University of Würzburg, studied at John Hopkins, practiced at the university's psychiatric clinic. He was an acknowledged expert in criminal criminality. He worked with the poor. He was the only psychiatrist who would treat the blacks, referred to him by Clarence Darrow, the famous lawyer who defended Stopes in the evolutionary monkey trial. And Wortham is one of a long line of scientists who went off piste to drive a social crusade, in this case, against the US comic industry. And we all seem to have survived the comic industry. Now, we have been here before, so my question is this, is why are we humans so addicted to connectivity? I'm almost there. Why <laughs> are we so addicted to connectivity? Is not breadth the new skill of the 21st century, having had 500 years where the major skill was depth? And my last part of this question is, I was fascinated by what you had to say. And when you talked about Save the Princess, and when you talked about the games, you may play games a lot. You talked about them in a way, as a games player, I did not recognize. So can you tell me which major Xbox or 
PS3 platform games you've played all the way through. And if one of them is Fallout 3, can you tell me how to get past the robots on level 8? <laughs> Thank you. OK, so there's various questions. The first is a slightly picky one, which is um, it's not very good logic to um, argue against something by one example or an analogy, because one could question the validity of the analogy. I could go back to you and say, what about the doctor that first drew a link between smoking and lung cancer? So I'd just, shown that I'd just suggest there was a link between smoking and lung cancer. You would have come up with that same thing. Or MMR. Yeah. So, so you know, I don't... I, I, no, but to just say one example of something that was inaccurate or silly is, doesn't invalidate something else, yeah. So that's it. Um, the second comparisons of the technologies in each age, I think there is a very big difference in that they're now pervasive and invasive in a way they weren't. I'm old enough to have grown up with just one telly in a household where that new technology was nonetheless like the Victorian piano, where it was actually a trigger for a family interaction and culture in a way that sitting in an isolated, sustained way doing nothing else is not. Yeah. So I don't think the analogy with any old culture is going to be um, scaring and jolting the poor old geriatrics. You know, I, I don't really think that's a very strong argument either. Your most interesting question was, why are we addicted to connectivity? Yeah. Um, do you mean brain connectivity? And I'll settle for that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a result, I think. Yeah. You know, for what O-level uh, yeah, boy, yeah, it's yeah. not bad, really. That, so. I think that is interesting because connectivity, let's say, is loosely related to seeing one thing in terms of something else, which I suggest is meaning. And human beings are constantly in search of meaning. Little kids, what does this mean? Well, and, and that is something that, although they can't articulate it, animals don't seem that keen, necessary to want to do. So we're always, what is the meaning of our lives? What's the point of everything? You know, and sometimes we don't have a point, and we don't have, I mean, we get depressed when we don't see the point of things. You know, the two are often related. So we are happiest when we suddenly discover a meaning, and certainly in science, where you see a connection. Those of you who are scientists, it's the most exciting thing. As someone says, to see what no one else has seen. No, see what everyone else has seen, but think what no one else has thought. Yeah. And making connections is what human beings do. It's a way of understanding the way of making sense, and therefore perhaps feeling safe in the world. Perhaps there is a survival value. It makes you feel safe and less threatened and will prolong your survival. It has to be tempered by the occasional why women and song, the loss of mind. But my argument is that the kinds of things um, that we have traditionally done have always been just a small part of our portfolio. And like all things, you shouldn't have anything in excess. And just doing one thing to exclude everything else, something that is patently seemingly to be addictive, Something that might be linked, and I just want to explore this, with certain worrying trends like rising autism, rising ADHD, and so on. Um, one shouldn't just necessarily dismiss someone who's saying, let's look at it. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying we can't be that complacent to take the risk. That's what I'm saying.